Welcome to our broadcast. For the first time in 89 years, there will be no World Series. But thanks to Emmy Award-winning filmmaker Ken Burns, we do have baseball. The director and producer of PBS's The Civil War has created a nine-part documentary on the history of our national pastime, which premiered Sunday on PBS. From Ty Cobb to Babe Ruth and Jackie Robinson to Reggie Jackson, Burns chronicles the game of baseball with his trademark completeness, 4,000 photos, 70 interviews, 18 and a half hours in all, commentators as diverse as Billy Crystal and Mario Cuomo. I'm very pleased to have Ken Burns here to talk about baseball, a game that he loves and a game that he clearly knows a lot about. Welcome. Hi, Charlie. Thank you for coming. I mean, this is uh, much awaited by me individually uh, because of a love of the game and because I've had the pleasure to interview some of the people uh, who were part of this series, whether it's Bob Costas or Ted Williams and many, many others. So I, I welcome you for a conversation. When did your affair with baseball begin? It began in Newark, Delaware, when I played the Pony League at age six and seven. I was, my strike zone was not that much larger than Eddie Goodell's. <laughs> yeah, I would walk on the first four pitches, yeah. uh, steal second on the fifth, and be at third on the sixth. I was the leadoff batter in our game, so we had a man in score, or shall I say, a boy in scoring position. Yeah. I loved it. I played it. It was a refuge from the tragedy that was overtaking my family. My mother was very sick through most of my early childhood and I I don't have the memories that others have about having of going to the game with the father or the mother I went to the game more or less alone yeah. as a way to escape that somewhere around Vietnam I fell out of baseball and came back with a vengeance in October of 1975 when Carlton Fisk started waving that ball fair in the sixth game of the 1975 World Series you're a Red Sox fan I am you have to add the word long-suffering before the Red Sox fan, yes. Uh, that time, uh, it, interesting in this film, there is a piece that we'll take a look at from Bob Costas. So many people, and especially women, ask about this relationship between young men and older men in baseball. In your film, in a dramatic and caring way, uh, Bob Costas defines what it meant to him and his father. Let's take a look at that. Here it is, Bob Costas talking in baseball. We're back with Ken Burns. Uh, tell me why other people love this sport so much and what it means, because you talk about Civil War as the Iliad and baseball as the Odyssey. Well, the, the Civil War defined us. Many people said that it's the great epic battle that defined our nation, made it what it is today. And therefore, the, the war, the Civil War, has been called the American Iliad. I have chosen to focus on baseball as a way to understand the country we became, not as a metaphor as much as a mirror, that baseball reflects all our tendencies. Walt Whitman felt this right at the time of the Civil War. He said it fits into our life as significantly as our constitutions. Somehow he saw something in this game, and it's a combination of lots of factors. It's a community game. You have to play it together. It's a beautifully designed game, unlike any other game. The defense has the ball. There's right. no clock. People score, not the ball score. All of these things kind of conspire to make it a, a literary game. Why have poets and writers and everyone been drawn to this game if there isn't something in its uh, initial construction that appeals? And then since it has accompanied our narrative, for 200 years, yeah. we can tie and measure the benchmarks of our own personal life and our larger national life by what's going on. You know, it, you know the great moment when, when uh, Justice Potter Stewart is handed a note in the Supreme Court and it says, <laughs> Crane Pool flies to left, Agnew <laughs> resigns. That's baseball. It had the priorities. <laughs> it? Here is what Walt Whitman said. Uh, well, it's our game. That's the chief fact in connection with it. America's game. It has the snap, go, fling of the American atmosphere. It belongs as much to our institutions, fits into them as significantly as our constitution's laws. It's just as important in the sum total of our historic life. Um, it's, did it change? How has it changed? And, and why in this film have you focused so much on the centrality of race 
in the evolution of baseball. This is our central story. As a country, we are founded more than 200 years ago on the most noble principle yet advanced in humankind, that all men are created equal. Yet the man who distilled the essence of the Enlightenment and put it into that magnificent sentence owned slaves. And mm. four score and seven years ago, we fought a war and killed 2% of our population and still didn't decide, ultimately, in the hearts and minds of American men and women, that there was all men were created equal. And so, it becomes the central thread. And if you are interested in knowing, as I am, what makes our country tick, who we are, then you have to see that race is the central thing. As you look at baseball, baseball's finest moment is when Jackie Robinson comes up. It is the first progress in civil rights since the Civil War. And it occurs not where we think these things occur. It occurs on the diamonds of our so-called national pastime. And as you begin to dig a little bit further, you find out that two years after 2% of our population died supposedly settling the issue, the all-black Pythian team of Philadelphia, not a Southern team, of Philadelphia, are denied membership in the National Association of Baseball Players. And from then on, we have excluded or found a way to exclude or to punish African Americans in baseball in much the same ways we have punished them in our larger society. So by, in a Blakeian sense, where you could find the universe in a grain of sand, you study baseball, you study ourselves. Take a look at this clip. This is Jackie Robinson's entry into Major League Baseball. Here it is. Clearly, to know you and to know about the making of the Civil War, one of your great heroes is Abe Lincoln. Is the hero for you of baseball Jackie Robinson? Yeah, and I didn't go in planning it that way. He snuck up on me. I knew that he would be a central figure. But I didn't understand, in a way, how powerful the emotional undertow is to baseball. I mean, you can talk about the broad sociological themes till you're blue in the face, but really it comes down to very powerful emotions that connect me to you and mm. to others about time, about memory, about family, and about home. And Jackie's story seems to add this Central American fault line about race to it and does it magnificently. He was asked by Branch Rickey, as you know, to turn the other cheek for three years, for three years. in the face of withering withering racial insight, uh, insults and abuse. And he did so magnificently. He transformed white baseball. He brought the Negro League style of play, f hit and run, base stealing, the psychological battle between the pitcher and the base runner, not just the batter. He brought the flavor of the Negro League game to baseball, but he did it carrying on his shoulders this remarkable burden. They put black hats on the field. They'd scream at him. They'd lay open their th his thighs with their spikes. And he essentially set the tone and the character of the upcoming civil rights movement, a combination of forbearance, but also a sense of militancy that it was going to come around. No man uh, has ever played the game who played it with more dignity as more he dig did. Can you imagine having to hold it in? People have said you can't, you can't play baseball angry. You have to be relaxed. And here's a man having to hold in everything. It's one of the great stories. I mean, Gerald Early, who's the head of the African American Studies Department at Washington University in St. Louis, says you could measure American history before Robinson and after Robinson. It's that much of a sea change. And we say, oh, this occurs in our game. Well, this game is a fantastic intersection of fact, the statistics, who won and yeah. lost, and metaphor, what it means. I mean, that's what a game is. Interesting, his wife in the stands, who's alive and lives oh. here in New York, had to stand and shield him. She had, she had promised Branch Rickey that she would, was also under the same constraints, that she couldn't yell, she couldn't defend her husband. And can you imagine this relatively small woman sitting in the stands, feeling the anger being hurled at her husband? I mean, the focus of, we can't even appreciate how bad it was, and hoping somehow that her body would intercept, that she could widen out far enough. If that isn't a symbol of... Uh, of, of his greatness and hers, uh, I don't know what is. For you, Jackie Robinson is the greatest player because of all this, not only a great player, but because of what I he's I think he's a real and, hero. And how, a true hero. Yeah. You make the point, actually, in conversation that, that tr there is a difference in celebrity yeah. who does something well on an athletic field and a true hero who Robinson did something well on an athletic field and was celebrated for it, but carried 
a much deeper and stronger. We confuse in our society celebrity and heroism. You know, they're very, very different. There are baseball heroes, the men who know how to hit the ball, Joe DiMaggio and Willie Mays and Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. And yet there are people who, who take their great skill as baseball players and add us something more. And that's a Jackie Robinson, that's a Kurt Flood, that's a Christy Mathewson and a Lou Gehrig at times. Um, that's a Branch Rickey, where they are called on to do something that is not expected of them. It's a Ted Williams, who when he is inducted into the Hall of Fame, in his first year of eligibility, stands up there and says, I would like to see Satchel Paige and Josh Gibson here, and they are not here because they did not get a chance. That's heroism. When in his moment of glory, when the greatest hitter who ever lived could quite rightfully bask in his own accomplishments, he took the time to um, speak up for those who were not spoken for and in helped initiate the move towards the inclusion of Negro League players. In the you home. mentioned Ted Williams. Let's talk a little bit about some of the other great heroes that are in this film and a part of the American history and a part of baseball. Ty Cobb, the he man that is, some say is the greatest player ever to play the game, but who saw it. his record broken by Pete Rose, who brought some sense of scandal to the game. He is the most interesting person that I got to know in the course of this series. Terrifying. He, like Jackie, is... Got from, to know in terms of he's dead, but you got to know him because in the way you got to know Abraham Lincoln. Someone told me that what I do is I wake the dead. Yes. And I think it must be for my own personal reasons, but somehow when you work on a project like this, you get to know these people and feel like you know them. Cobb and Robinson both come from rural Georgia, both have terrific tempers, and there the similarities end. The black man, Jackie Robinson, makes the most heroic gesture in the history of baseball. Ty Cobb just it was a bundle of anger, virulent racism, and it was with him his whole life, and yet it produced great baseball. And finally, at the end, you say, at what cost? But he is, he livens up page after page of history. Where do you come down when you mention someone like Ty Cobb, because he is often part of a footnote to this story, Pete Rose, and whether he should be in the Hall of Fame? Somehow, we, in the broad sense of media, have become so sanctimonious, like the colonial elders who paint the scarlet letter A. How could we possibly deny Pete Rose, despite all of his problems and his foibles and his fault, entry into the Hall of Fame? If we were to do that, we need to retroactively go back and take out Babe Ruth. We certainly have to take out Ty Cobb, and probably half the members wouldn't um, survive a kind of sanctimonious and moralistic scrutiny that we apply now. Put Pete Rose in. I'm glad if, if a jury of his peers found him guilty of tax evasion and whatever it is, he goes to jail and pays for that crime. But let's honor him for something, which is he has Do more Do you hits. think your point of view represents the, the majority opinion of people who will vote for his election I into the Hall change. of Fame? I hope it changes. I think there's, there's a little bit of discomfort I, I'm beginning to perceive that I hope that eventually he'll come in uh, because we can't, the Hall of Fame can't be an arbiter of moral character. It has to be an arbiter of baseball excellence. I would ask, who did you want to talk to that's not among the 70? Joe DiMaggio, I think. Why did he say no? Well, I just think he was sort of unapproachable. I mean, we made the usual inquiries. And, and you had all the people who could get to him. Oh, yeah, and we, we made the things, and there was no response. And I, don't want to, I didn't want to push. I didn't, I didn't push it. Uh, we, had, we have Ted Williams, and he's fantastic, and Mickey Mantle is amazing, and old Negro League stars who bring their story, their now oral history, alive. Uh, but I would have wanted to find out more about the Clipper. And yeah. yet there are many who told me, look, you don't need it. I mean, we handled yeah, it well. Yeah, but that's, you wanted but it you, badly. I want to sit there like, and feel what that is about him. But, and, but did he just simply say, I don't yeah. want to do it with explanation or no, just no? No, it was just no. It was just no. And how hard did you push? Uh, not hard. I, I really, I don't want to be that kind of, I'm not in a kind of news relationship. No, There's got to be somebody has got to want to do it. And Ted said yes. I mean, he was very hard to get a hold of, but once he'd seen the Civil War, he said yes. And we came and we had a remarkable yeah. conversation. Anyone else that no. you thought was really would have made a significant contribution no. that you couldn't. No, well, you know who I would have in the non ball player yeah. is lots of writers. You yeah. know, I finally had to say, how do I decide? So I took the Washington Post and I said, I'll do Shirley Povich and Tom Boswell. Right. That'll be Two a family. This is a you family bet. story. I'll look at broadcasting and I've got a million people. So I'll do the grandfather, the son, 
and the grandson, right. Red Barber, Vin Scully, and Bob Costas. You actually went down, the first interview was with Red Barber with Red because Barber. you were worried about his health. I was worried about his health, and I went six months before the Civil War was out to Tallahassee. Yeah. And he actually lived several more years, but I, I mean, he, he was the person that I needed to go and see first, and he's fantastic. There is a moment when he describes a conversation he had with Branch Rickey telling him about why he was going to bring a black man and he goes this I know and when I'm in an interview I usually am a blank I just listen I try to soak it up yeah. and I said at that moment I know exactly where this is going to go in the film I know there'll be a title that says this I know and it will initiate what will be the dramatic centerpiece of this series, which is the arrival of Jackie Rose. A little bit about process. Do you know, I mean, have you read everything and talked to everybody before you sit down? No. Or is a learning process It's a for learning you? process. In fact, I, in many cases, try to stay ignorant of some of the details, and my co-producer, Lynn Novick, will right. ingest all of the material and will go to an interview. She was I a casual fan. She was a casual fan, but now <laughs> knows more than <laughs> yeah. I turn. I said, Lynn, <laughs> you yeah. know, tell me now, who, who did this when? But I'll go to an interview with the great hitter Charlie Rose, and I don't want you to fill a space in my script. I wish. I just I want <laughs> you tell me about it. In my fondest dreams, I, I, know, I was just I was Listen, doing. Ted taking. Williams once told me the hardest thing in the world to do in sports is, hit is to hit a baseball. Oh, that's absolutely oh. right. And look at Michael Jordan, who was one of the greatest yeah, stories, the, perhaps the greatest athlete of our age. Yeah. What does he want to do once he's had it all in that sport? <laughs> he wants to hit a baseball. Back. He wants to hit a baseball. Which he obviously can't do as well as he'd like to. But look how he's doing it. He's suffering it with great humility right, because right. he's doing it for his father. Time, right. memory, bet. family, and home. But I don't want you to tell me something I already know you're going to tell me. I want you to surprise me. I don't want you to fit into some place in my script. I want you to make a new scene in my script accidentally. And so we collect all these still photographs, we collect all this first person testimony, we collect this on camera testimony, we look for the newsreels, and then we walk into the editing room and go, oh And my when does God. the structure come? So I mean, there's a bit about this, and I've got it down here. You've got this thing divided 18 and a half hours, mm -hmm. and yeah. nine consecutive nights on PBS with a weekend right. stop. With a weekend stop. And it, it's, it's nine innings. The uh, first inning, 1840s to 1990. Our game 1900. chronicles 1900. I'm sorry, chronicles the rise of baseball from a gentleman's hobby to a national sport in one generation. Second inning is 1900 to 1910. The look of eagles examines the baseball's early legends, including Ty Cobb, Walter Johnson, John McGraw, and others. Third inning 1910 to 1920. The filth of 50 million people the culminates. Faith, the, faith. The, the the faith of 50 million people culminates with the Black Sox scandal. Fourth inning 1920 to 1930. A national heirloom focuses on Babe Ruth. Tell me about Babe. Well, 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 what do we have in our environment that's more impressive than Babe Ruth? Uh, George Will says in the film he's an Everest in Kansas. <laughs> and I, I just, I want to let that image set in. Mount Everest. A in Mount Everest the of in the middle of Kansas. And that says it all. This, in an age of conspicuous consumption, he's the greatest consumer of them all. And John Goodman in the flawed portrait and William Bendix in the saintly portrait yeah. do not do justice to this complicated man. And I Why have was he complicated? What was complicated His about birth, Beirut? He, he grew up in a, in a dysfunctional family. They put him in a reform school. He was called nigger lips. He was belittled. And all of a sudden, he learned from an Irish priest uh, how to hit a, a, a baseball with a shinny stick. And he could, is prodigious. What did he have? I mean, I've always been fascinated because he does not look. He does not have the look of a great athlete. No, he doesn't. But he had the capacity. He could first hit, as a pitcher. First as a pitcher. He, you know, in, if you were to stop time in 1920, you would record Babe Ruth as the finest left-handed pitcher in the American yeah. League in the 19-teens. Pitching for the Boston Red Sox. And that would be all right. As Dan Okren said, it's like, he, he's like <laughs> Beethoven and Cezanne in one person because yeah. then he switches over and becomes the greatest power hitter and the greatest <laughs> player in the game. I mean, you, all, all the arguments that we can have about who's the best, it always has to be after Ruth. A, a talent that is so remarkable, the way he dominated the game. I mean, we think of Michael Jordan well, and Muhammad Ali as, as being a figure beyond Does everybody their sport. say his like will never come? I, I can't imagine anybody. The combination of the joie de vivre alone. You yeah. know, he never, he wouldn't remember your name. You would be kid, even if he roomed with you. Uh, and the, be able to ingest hot dogs. It's about appetite. Yeah. The appetite for stardom, the appetite for home now, runs. Was he the, the first player to make $100,000? Yes. Uh, your heroes that come out of this, Christy Matheson, yeah. he's a portrait. What's really remarkable about this to me 
And what you do so well, and did it in Civil War, and you've done it in other places, and you're going to do it, I guess, with your next project is Thomas Jefferson, Thomas and Jefferson. after that, Lewis and Clark. Right. I mean, you go from a great thinker to great explorers. Um, who, who else emerges from this for you as characters we ought to take note well, of in at, this conversation? At the end of this thing, you're going to know 60 or 70 people. Right. You're going to know 60 or 70 events. Even if you're not a, a fan, they're going, sort of guides to an American soul that I'm interested in pursuing. But I'm drawn to John McGraw. I'm drawn to Christy Matthews. John McGraw is a manager. A manager and a, f and a third baseman for the Baltimore Orioles and the New York Giants manager and this fiery temperament, an incredibly complex figure who, when he died, his wife found among his effects a list of all the black players he had secretly wished he could hire over the years. And a manager of the Giants. And a manager of the Giants yeah. forever. Yeah. There's Christie, who was the Christian gentleman. There's Grover Cleveland Alexander, the alcoholic and epileptic, yeah. who has this great moment of glory in the 1926 World Series when he strikes out Tony Lazari. How about Kurt Flood? Kurt Flood is, I think, after Robinson and Aaron of the Black Stars, the one I'm really drawn to in this series. Here is a man who suffered all of the indignities of Robinson, but did so after it was over, so nobody was paying attention anymore. He plays magnificently throughout the 60s, and in 69, he is traded to the Phillies, and he says, I'm not going to go. You don't he, own me. You do not own me. I am not a piece of property, Bowie Kuhn. I am a man. Now, it's how ironic that this plantation system of the Reserve Clause should be, first be legitimately tested in this century by a black man saying, I am a man. And he falls on his sword. He, he doesn't play Major League Baseball, and it will take Marvin Miller and the shrewdness of getting collective bar a binding arbitration and a third arbiter to, to and a test case, Messerschmitt and McNally, to make to break the reserve clause and establish free agency. Yeah. But Kurt Flood led the way. He's the and John Brown. And it essentially Brown. ended his career, did it? Oh, it ended it. Right. Absolutely. He is John Brown. Right. To made the uh, ultimate sacrifice in terms of his career and changed his life forever. Forever. Uh, Buck is said. Buck O'Neill is said to be the conscience of this film. Yeah, absolutely. There are a many living, Shelby Foots, like right. Dan O'Krent. Yeah, he's and, also characterized and, and, as the Shelby Foot of this and film. And Robert Creamer. And there's only who one is he, Shelby and why do we say this? Buck O'Neill was born in Florida. He, he uh, worked in the celery fields, had to get out, found a way out in education and baseball. He became a member of the Kansas City Monarchs, star first baseman, led the league in hitting. The Kansas City Monarchs were the New York Yankees of yeah. the black leagues. He then um, he played with Satchel Paige against Josh Gibson. He knew them all. He became their manager, and he became the first black coach in the majors. And we went to him to talk about the Negro Leagues. And then we went back to him to talk about baseball, in general, and then we went back to him to talk about life, this yeah. undertow that I'm talking about. And I have had the great good fortune, as you know, to interview yeah. many, many people. No one comes close to Buck in the humanity. I, yeah. I, I, f I feel like he's a member of my family now. In terms of his humanity. His, his yeah. humanity and his understanding of how you and I feel and without hatred, uh, but with, with a backbone, uh, with a generosity. Man of grace to those. and dignity. And, oh, yeah. it, 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 you love him. Take a look at this, and this is a. Buck Neal. Here it is, Buck O'Neill. I'm back now. This was divided into innings, and I want to talk about a couple of other people. Uh, the fourth inning was Babe Ruth. We talked about fifth inning, which is on September 22nd. Shadowball covers the Depression years, uh, Ruth fading career, a new generation of stars, Williams and DiMaggio, and the parallel world of the Negro League. Uh, September 25th is the sixth inning, 1940 to 1950, uh, the great years of Williams and DiMaggio. Was there one great game for you, one great series for you as a fan, as, as a, a fan filmmaker? As a fan in 75, the 75 Red series, Sox. it brought and me back. The Red Sox and the Reds? Is, the Red it? Sox and the Cincinnati right. Reds. It goes to seven games, the Reds triumph. But in the sixth game, the underdog Boston Red Sox come back. They tie it up when the game is seemingly lost. It goes into extra innings. There are two spectacular defensive plays on both sides, a play at the plate uh, where the Red Sox, whose scoring would give them the winning run, is thrown out. Uh, Dewey Evans makes a spectacular catch, uh, and all of a sudden, it comes up and, and, and Carlton Fisk steps up to the plate yeah. and hits this home run, which we know his body yeah. willed fair. For, that was, as Dan Okren said, a galvanic moment that brought many people back to the national pastime. What about the music in the film? 
Well, it's on several layers. It's got the traditional relationship to music that I've always enjoyed, which is taking the old folk music, in this case many old baseball tunes that we discovered at the Hall of Fame, and rearranging them. But it is also, because we cover so much territory, a history of American music, from parlor music to jazz to Dixieland, Duke Ellington, Lester Young, early rock and roll, R&B, uh, uh, hard rock. And how many times do we hear Take Me Out to the Ball Game? We must hear it 60 or 70 <laughs> times, from cocktail music to uh, new versions by Carly Simon to uh, amazing, amazing uh, upbeat versions. September 26th, the seventh inning, uh, 1950 to 1960, the capital of baseball celebrates the domination of New York City baseball. Well, I was editing, and I realized that the 50s, I was going to call it the best it ever was, because now with the black players up there, uh, I feel that the game was the best it ever was, beginning then. But I realized that it was all about New York, and suddenly yeah. I decided to turn what baseball seemed to be was alive. About New York it was about New York, and the Giants and the Yankees and the Dodgers wrote baseball history year in and year out, and did so with um, an an importance that I'm beginning to appreciate only now. When you think that when the Dodgers and Giants uh, left, something went out of the city. It certainly went out of Brooklyn, and uh, we're looking for what that extra thing is, the identity that a team brings a town in a way that we don't feel now. Who are the contemporary players, those that are playing the game now, who are in the film? Very, very few. We, we, the last inning is called Home, and it goes from 1970 to right. the present. And we have Willie Stargell and, the, and, and uh, Pete Rose and some of the scandals, and we really slow down this thing. I'm, an, I'm a historian, I, I don't, or an amateur historian, and I don't like to, to deal with the journalistic recent past. But we go right up to the Carter and the uh, uh, Toronto Blue Jays winning the World Series and making it truly a world series between two countries and not yeah. one, and sort of a drinking that in. I, I don't want to make judgments about him. I think the new, I think the game right now has never been better. Why do you say that? I think what, we're what? seeing talent equal to anything we've ever seen before, like Griffey and, and Thomas, Thomas and Williams. I think we're seeing great pitching. Remember, we've gone through an era of parody like we have never seen the last 20 years. We've only seen a couple repeats, uh, Minnesota and, and, and Toronto. And there was one 10-year period when it was a different team every year, and last place teams would come to, f to first. Great pitchers like Clemens, you know, Maddox. I mean, this is a great, great period, which makes the pain of the current labor stuff all the more poignant for me. Uh, it, we're obviously not going to have baseball this year. We're not going to have a World Series. And some say that we probably won't see baseball, if at all, next year until after the midseason break. Uh, what is it that brings you the most pain to know that? Um, Charlie McDowell said that baseball was the background music of America and I wanted more than anything for the series to go out with the proof of the pudding in the fact that even if you said oh well I'm not interested in the teens I'm gonna turn on the game that you could find in the moments of the game the intersections the intervals and this is a game Dan Okren said about pondering inaction as you look at the pitcher mm -hmm. what does he have to throw this guy or where are the outfielders gonna position themselves where's the cutoff it has a different pace than any other sport like nothing else that as you ponder this in action, that the proof of what I'm trying to say about the game is there, and that I miss it. You know, uh, Boswell said the six months of the year Tom went, Boswell. T of the yeah. Washington Post, he said the six months of the year when there's baseball, it's just a little bit better. There's something more in our lives. I feel that too. I mean, I was yesterday. I was sitting in a diamond. Uh, next to a diamond in Virginia talking to somebody, a reporter who didn't really care about baseball that much. And there was a practice going on and I felt a tidal pull to get into it. And I said, you know, I, I have to let you know that my body is being drawn into this game. That I want, not to so much watch, I want to get out there. You've had the joy of throwing out the first ball. At, at once or twice or uh, about eight times yeah. <laughs> so I, why do you get to do it so much i mean well we've been on this tour yeah. and 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 to stand on the mound in a do stadium, we have a videotape of that i i will find you one <laughs> i mean you yes. do learn finally to get it right yeah well the first time i threw a perfect strike and the catcher just went huh yeah. And and he walked out. He says, "That's the first strike I've had yeah. all year." Because they're the usual <laughs> yeah. Rotarians right. like Ken Burns right. out there right. bouncing right. the pitches. And the <laughs> next day, I got cocky at Jacobs Field and I bounced the ball. Yeah. The next day at uh, Memorial Stadium. Yeah, Jacobs Field is, is Cleveland. It's Cleveland. Right. It's a beautiful New. park. Then I was in County Stadium in Milwaukee, and I've been throwing strikes more or less. Buck says 
Yeah, does Buck go with you to throw yeah, these strikes? Yeah, Buck was at the best moment of the summer is that I threw out the first ball on August 3rd at Royal Stadium when the Royals da donned the uniform of the 1924 champion Kansas City Monarchs. And even the scoreboard said the Athletics versus the Monarchs. And they played in the baggy pants yeah. of wool uniforms and they brought back all these old Monarchs to celebrate. And I threw out the first pitch to Buck. Talk about some of the myths of baseball. For example, uh, Judge Landis, who in a sense came on and gave baseball some integrity after the scandal, also is portrayed here as, as a man with clay feet. Uh, tardy on civil rights beyond belief. It is his death that allows, in many ways, Robinson to advance. Yeah. Uh, Benjamin Chandler, Happy Chandler, becomes right. the commissioner, and he realizes that if you can die at Oka, uh, Guadalcanal in Okinawa, you can play Major League Baseball after the yeah. Second World War. And for those years, Landis did nothing to help. And other than the sheer sense of, of, of the significance of it and, and, and the rightness of it and the morality of it and the justice of it, uh, how did African Americans change the game? Oh, in every way. And, and, you know, we traditionally, even when we feel sympathetic towards an African American history in our kind of typically patronizing attitude, we always balkanize it into some Black History right, Month and right. still segregate it. Right. Still segregated. And what we wanted to do in this was to integrate it from the very first inning on. They played a different kind of game that was about speed, yeah. about intelligence, about uh, bunting, about um, messing up the pitcher. Robert Creamer describes watching Robinson walk in that first year and then manufacture a run all by himself by spooking the pitcher, by yeah. taking long leads, and then by the time the pitcher throws back, walking till finally um, uh, the third baseman is being called over to hold Robinson on third. Yeah. And he said, I've never seen that. Never seen this. this is one of the David Halberstam in his book, October 1964, book. talks about how the St. Louis Cardinals represented the newness of baseball because in the National League you had more African Americans and Bob Gibson and, right. and others. And Kurt who, Flood. And Kurt Flood who'd made that team. And then they come in that series against the New York Yankees who represented the old, you know, the the old, old way. Story, and, yeah. power, and, and also power hitting yes. with Mantle and Maris versus the new speed of the Cardinals with, with Lou Brock, for example. That's right. Now playing for the Cardinals. And the that was a transition, too, in baseball. The single most important statistic I've come across, and I'm not yeah. wedded to statistics. I love the numbers of baseball, but I'm not wedded to it, is that in the years after Robinson's arrival, blacks won the MVP in the National League nine out of the next 11 years. Yeah. Now, if that does not say, and that's when there's just a trickle even in the National League, if that doesn't say what we were withholding, we cannot call it the national pastime. Does it have the same appeal today to those young athletes, whether they're black or white or, or, or Hispanic or, or Asian American? Hispanic, we open our ninth inning with the Dominicans who play in Upper Manhattan with a fury and a fever that would belie all the prognosticators yeah. about the death of baseball. It's not as popular, but I think baseball's always had these waves. I have two daughters who, we read the box scores, we play baseball and catch every day, we love to go to games, and as one unscientific reporter, I will tell you that there's uh, nothing diminished in the affection of, for baseball right. in our net. Before we go, uh, this is an introduction to this film, and we're showing it as our last clip, but it is about what this game is about. Take a look at this uh, with this extraordinary aerial shot of night baseball. Here it is. When you look at that and you appreciate the love and the beauty and, and, and all the symmetry of it, and Bart Giamatti, um, to me, was a hero yes. and somebody who loved the game and could articulate with a great eloquence the game. Um, we were going to interview him uh, just after he got back from his vacation, after the Rose incident was right. passed, and then we lost and him. And he had a heart attack. That's you used to talk about the, the, the fact that it was played outdoors and the sun under the sky and the green and, and, and the symmetry of the whole thing and all of that. Um, one more time, because if there's been some criticism, and I want you to respond to it, it is this notion that, that uh, it is, as Whitman said, a game. It's our game. That's the chief fact in connection with it, America's game, blah, 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 blah. Is it possible to read too much into the history of baseball, that it does, that, that that it is not the Civil War. 
Oh, it is most uh, definitely. It's a game. The, it is definitely a game, but games are a wonderful, uh, and particularly this game is sort of the no drama of our culture. It's where we play out a lot of our fantasies. I'm very happy to have Bill Buckner have the ball go between his yeah. legs and not mine. And I invest things with importance. And all I've tried to do wait, is wait, not some... You didn't mind, or Bill Buckner didn't oh, he, mind, or he, uh, millions I, of Red Sox fans I, didn't I, mind. I die when I see this still, <laughs> yeah. but I'm, I prefer it to happen to him. Right. Um, we can invest it. We can get too silly about it. But what I think we've done is said, if you look at this game, it reflects ourselves back to ourselves. We can read whatever we want. There are levels to look at baseball, and there are levels to look at this series. It is 18 and a half hours of the game of baseball. If you squint a little bit between the edges, come many of these social themes of race, of labor, of immigration, of women, of cities. Yeah. If you squint a little bit farther, you, you, you begin to feel this tidal movement of emotions that reflects some of our, our, our feelings. Jacques Barzin, the Columbia right. University scholar, said, whoever wants to know the heart and mind of America had better learn baseball. I agree. What about women in baseball? They have tried to play and have been essentially excluded at the highest professional levels for a long time. Alta Weiss, in the first decade of this century, played semi-professional ball and was so skilled at it that her father eventually bought her a barnstorming team of all-stars, renamed it the Weiss All-Stars, and she was fabulous, the All-American Girls League. And you know what? In our lifetime, we will see a woman playing in the major leagues. She'll be a pitcher and she'll throw mostly breaking balls, but she will be in the major leagues and then we will truly have a national yeah. pass. I, I also mean this in a larger way too. What about the appeal of A, this film, or B, baseball to women? I made it for the woman who says, boy, I love the Civil War film, but Baseball? baseball and I said but you like military played, history and they say no this is about life lessons and tragedies and classic confrontations and the sense of who we are as a people that's all this is it's the continuation of that story it's the sequel who said history had to be wars and generals and presidents we could find the same story of the last 130 years since the Civil War in the writings of women in furniture in architecture and I'm saying one way to see it is in baseball and when you study it and you do it in a way that's sympathetic. I've spent the last year sharing it with particularly those women who say, uh, baseball, that's for my yeah. son or my husband, and they come away converted. They say, wow, this is a different story than I understood. How did it change your attitude about baseball or your understanding of baseball in terms of investing how many years? In, four, in, and in four and a half years. You know, truthfully, it liberated something in me emotionally that I had kept in check. I realized that I could, I, that I find a certain pleasure in the game of baseball that is indescribable and that I could take it back in and reinvest it. That was part of 75, was for me realizing I didn't have to, for whatever political reasons of, of the war in Vietnam and counterculture, I didn't need to get rid of this game that had given me so much pleasure as a boy. And, and I think what I've done is in each successive wave as we pass through the film is I deepen my love for the game. Take me one more time. Your mother had cancer. My mother had cancer and I was aware of it from, you know, three or four years old. And what? And so you were, you, you had the pain of her cancer. I was just, I was a little boy unable to have a childhood. I was, I was suddenly a young man, an adult, and uh, I had to be strong. And there were very few places where you could still be a kid. She died when I was 11, and even then that didn't stop because you had to continue being strong. And baseball was one of the places where you could just be a kid. Do you think that experience somehow made you do what you do now? Absolutely. I remember when she was dying, I used to listen to the, the dogs and the fire hoses in Selma and get incredibly anxious. And so I brought in from left field the cancer of race that was, was, was killing my country and, the, and, and tried to obscure the cancer that was overtaking my family. And that's why I'm so concerned, not just with waking the dead, Mm. but with trying to find that, that stream where our promise might intersect with our reality. And I believe as a republic we will have the greatest redemption as a nation if we can ever find the solution to this qu question of race, of why people think that Buck O'Neill is not the same as me. And I consider him a member of my family. 
I had, I'll tell you, I made this film for one reason. I was at the All-Star Game. I was in the Celebrity Hitting Contest. And it was a charity event. An upper deck was doing, giving charity. Some people did Big Brother, Big Sister in this hospital. Mine was the Negro League Museum. And a reporter came up to me and said, another reporter had said to him, what's Ken Burns' charity? And he said, the Negro League Museum. And he goes, I didn't know Ken Burns was black. When we don't have to wonder whether I'm black or white to be interested in the Negro League Museum is when we will have accomplished what we set out to do. And all of these things, whether it's baseball, Civil War, Huey Long, Thomas Jefferson, the, the Congress, that done as a they are all an attempt to sort of describe either the negative or the positive a possibility, a possibility for us. And, and so who is Ken Burns? Is he, he's a historian, he's a filmmaker, he is a, um, he's what? What's he building? What is the body well, I, of work? You know what I discovered in this project is that I've been paying lip service to this idea that I'm interested in this question, who are we as a right, people? Right. What I discovered in this... You're interested sort of, in? I, who am I? And just go farther. That's an obvious thing for a filmmaker to be interested in, but it's each one of these these projects reflect something back about me and that I am interested in an American character but I'm interested first in what what the complicated pain or joy of this American character is and these films help narrow down um, the observation so I am first and foremost a filmmaker I am an amateur historian completely untrained I rely on the expertise of distinguished historians who advise us on every project but it is the choice of history is like a painter choosing oils instead of watercolors I'm first and foremost a filmmaker uh, uh, I it's a wonderful series um, because it is about America uh, you have an opportunity to uh, to experience things about baseball that you don't know. I had an opportunity the other night to go to the Hall of Fame for tennis. I mean, I'm a tennis player. And there in that room were some of the legends of tennis, and it brought it alive to me. You go back to the dead and bring them alive in this film and bring alive the history of what this sport has meant to us and, and what it means to the American psyche. You do it with the help of people from Stephen Jay Gould to, as we say, to Mario Cuomo and Bob Costas uh, and people who know the people who made the game. Uh, my congratulations, Ken. Thank you, Jim.